Trevor Karitson. We are coming at you live from the Evolutionary Radio headquarters. As always, my co-host Steve Smee is joining me. Yes, good evening, guys. We have another special guest this week. Alex Keichel. Is that how you pronounce it? Kickle, but close enough. Kickle? Okay. <laughs> we just talked about that before we started. I already <laughs> forgot how to pronounce it. Literally, literally right. 10 <laughs> seconds before hitting the court. <laughs> I get it all the time. All, all since I was in grade school, high school, it's all good. <laughs> so the reason I want to get Alex on is obviously Alex is a smart guy, but I had a lot of listeners ask me, you know, like, what is the life of a prep coach? And, you know, Alex, he owns the prepcoach.com. He runs a successful online personal training business. So I thought it'd be really cool to figure out how Alex got into personal training and what a daily routine kind of looks like for Alex. So we're recording this episode at 8 p.m which is perfect. I purposely want to do it in the evening. So Alice can kind of explain what his day looked like today. And, you know, it seems like being a personal trainer would be, you know, the greatest job ever, but people don't realize it's pretty much sitting behind a computer for 12 hours a day answering emails. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you alternate, you know, you get 10 texts and 10 emails and 10 texts and 10. Yeah. Emails. But, but before we get into all that, Alex, let our listeners know a little bit about you. Um, how did you get into weight training and fast forward to today, you know, where, where did this passion for bodybuilding and being a prep coach come from? Okay. So first of all, I can talk forever. So if I talk too much, just tell me to shut the hell up and I'll kind of speed up the process. Um, uh, started off like everyone does usually doing team sports. So I did lacrosse and amateur boxing all through high school, um, was basically on track to have a scholarship, everything paid for through college with lacrosse. And then junior year, I got a concussion where it basically left me, couldn't walk, couldn't talk for six months. So after that, I, I literally woke up in my bed. Like I, I remember playing a lacrosse game, got hit from behind. And then I remember waking up in my bed, walked to the bathroom, I'm all disoriented. I look in the mirror and I lost like 40 pounds. And in my mind, it was in five seconds. When in reality, it was really six months. And at that point, it was like, shit, okay, I, I need to actually figure out how to just heal my brain, how to get back to functioning normally walking. So had to go through all that basic rehab, started getting into nutrition, started going, obviously, you know, now it's time for college. So what are we going to do? Um, decided to go into nutrition dietetics. That was my beginning field. And I ended up shadowing Bonnie Tracy. She was at the time the dietitian for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I didn't really like at least some of the constraints that you had to have from the legal side of things. So I decided to kind of pull back and switch my fields. Um, so then that led me to actually getting the same degree that Eric Helms has. And that is actually, um, he got his bachelor's. I think we have the same bachelor's, but I think we have different masters. My master's is in performance enhancement and injury prevention. So a lot of it was all biomechanics, bioenergetics, anatomy, physiology, all the basic stuff, you know. Rewind a little bit. After I decided what I wanted to do, you know, what I want to do from college aspect, what I want to do with education aspect, that's whenever I figured, okay, I can't do anything more with contact because obviously getting punched in the head with boxing is just going to make the concussion worse. And so then I, you know, my friend, uh, was actually his older brother started bodybuilding. So I got in touch with his prep coach, Derek Natcher. Derek, shout out to you, man. Great guy. Actually, I haven't talked to him in years, but um, just a really nice individual. And that's how it started, you know, and I started logging everything on bodybuilding.com. I started really getting into the research because I was obviously going to school, trying to learn more. And I always just loved education. So as I'm posting up on the forums, I have people reaching out to me basically saying, you know, Hey, you seem like, you know, your shit. Can you do your prep? Can you do my prep for you? Or can you do your prep for me? And I told him, I was like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, but yeah, <laughs> if you trust me, I didn't charge anyone. And uh, it was funny because people just started coming to me because I was posting up on the forums and that kind of led to people coming in really good shape, placing good. And then they would tell their friends just kind of picked up from there, you know, and uh, I got into, I'll say probably a couple of years of personal training in the gym. And it got to the point where I was rushing off to the bathroom to answer emails. Like my prep coaching on the side had grown that much to where my daily job of being an in-person trainer was kind of, becoming irrelevant, you know, it was kind of like, okay, I'm killing myself at this job, making 
such a small amount of money whenever I'm making this much money with my prep coaching. So that just didn't make sense to me, you know? And so I decided to take it full time. And that's where I've been for the last five, six years. I have a lot of friends from church who don't lift weights. They don't really get it, right? And they're like, how do you find lifting weights enjoyable? You, you take a weight, you lift it up, you put it back down, you do that over and over and over. Like, it just seems so redundant. Mm. But then I say, like, once you start building some muscle, it's like acquiring money. You can never have enough. It gets yeah. <laughs> and, and someone who doesn't lift weights will never understand how satisfying it feels to, you know, start being able to change your body. Um, so, yeah, I, I see you. Like, you're, you seem like a competitive guy. You're into sports. You start lifting weights. You start seeing some results. And then automatically you get that bug in your body. Exactly. Yeah. And that, it's exactly like you said. Anything in life, everyone's going to have a passion for something, whether it is your kids, whether it's your job, whether it's having dogs, whether it is a sport, whatever it is, everyone has something that makes them get up in the morning. And if you don't have that, you're going to be one of those sad individuals that are just lost. And I feel so bad for those people because what's motivating you to get up every day? Like I look forward to getting up every single freaking day. Like sometimes I hate going to bed because I just want to stay up and keep working and keep doing what I'm doing, you know? And it, it's kind of like, if, if someone doesn't have that, it, it's just, it's such a shame because I feel like they're missing out so much on life. You're just missing out on so much happiness. Interesting. Interesting. So, Steve's in a little bit of a different situation. He has a full-time job. Okay. I'm currently doing my master's. Once I'm done my master's, I'm planning on doing med school. Is this something you see yourself doing for the rest of your life, Alex? Most definitely. I, I definitely at some point want to go back and get my PhD just because I just, again, like I said, I'm, I'm such a fan of education just for the sake of learning. You know, I, I feel like you can never learn too much. And so no matter what, I still want to go back to school just to have that. But... I don't ever see myself, you know, obviously I can't speak to the future. Um, there's obviously going to be more business ventures that'll open up along the way, but I will always be prep coaching in some aspect. You know, you, once you get to, and I'm not going to, I want to make sure I clarify this, but I'm not going to be John Meadows status because that, that's a big claim to make. But once you get to that point, then you kind of have to pull back on the prep coaching because you have a paid site because you're doing all these seminars because you have all these different things rolling, you know, but no matter what, it's definitely going to be at some, you know, aspect of my life. So we got some really, really good listener questions. Um, a lot of people sent me some direct messages on Instagram. Nice. I did not mention this person's name because he's a pretty high, high end prep coach. A lot of people would actually okay. um, He's doing really well right now. Uh, he's making a living training people, but he wants to know what's your 10 and 20 year plan? Because as you know, as a prep coach, yep. there's no retirement plan. There's no yep. pension or anything yep. like that. And I thought that was a really great question. Do you have you know, a 20 year plan in place? Are you so, training someone to eventually take over for you? So I'm very lucky in the sense that at least from the, we'll say from the legal aspect of things, from a lot of the financial aspect of things, I'm really good at making money. I'm really good at growing, expanding my business. I'm not so good at managing it. Meaning again, whenever, whenever you look at taxes, like, I got screwed my first couple of years in taxes because I didn't know what I was doing. Luckily, my fiance works in a bank. She understands a lot of that. She understands the retirement plans and all that kind of fun stuff. So I rely really heavily on her to basically set us up for the future because I, I can I can make it, but I want to make sure we can keep it. I want to make sure we can create manageable growth. So that's a big thing. Having her on my side really does change at least you know my future. Um, because she can help me out in ways that I just, you know, I, I may be really good at anatomy and physiology, but you put a math problem in front of me and I will shit the bed every time. Little things like that, she just really covers me at, you know, so we have that. Um, you know, one of the biggest things is learn to create manageable growth. You know, take the Krispy Kreme example. You look at Krispy Kreme uh, at one point in time, they blew up. There was, there was hundreds of stores everywhere. Next year, they're completely out of business. There's one or two places here or there because they grew too fast and they couldn't keep up with it. And I see a lot of prep coaches making that mistake. So for myself, I've made sure that was one thing that I, I've always been very aware of. I've never wanted to take on too many clients at one time to where my quality would suffer, to where you know communication would suffer, or anything like that. And over time, you get better at handling more and more clients. You know, So you have that. You have another aspect of And like I said, I could fucking talk for days. So if I talk too much, tell me shut up. Um, you look at the other aspects and you have... Obviously, once you can't take on any more clients, then you look at other streams of revenue, 
Okay. From that aspect, you can get into the product side of things. You can get into the supplement, you know, side of things. There's there's a lot of different ventures you can get into. And right now, I'm very lucky to be making the connections that I am to, you know, talking with the people that I am and to just have the success that I've had so far. Interesting, interesting. I'm like you. I really enjoy making money. But I always tell people how you become a millionaire is not about how much money you make. It's about how much money your money makes you. Yeah. So I have all of my money through day trade. My yep. dad, he's a mathematician. Uh, he's actually a professor. And oh, nice. He taught me all about how the probability and stocks, you can kind of make an algorithm and see, you know, when to buy and when to sell. So that's actually how I made all my money was through day trade. But Very cool. W- whatever you want to invest in, you know, whether you, uh, you want to invest in real estate or whatever, you never want to just have money sitting in a bank. You're not going to make any money because the interest rate is like 0.1% and the rate of inflation is like 3%. So you need to be investing your money in something. Completely agree. And like I said, that's why I'm so lucky to have my fiance. Because again, I, I can I can make the capital. I just can't make my money make me more money. In terms of the investment side of things, like everyone's really big into Bitcoin now and all the cryptocurrencies. And that makes no sense to me. It just, I, I look at that stuff, people try and teach me and it just, it doesn't connect in my brain, you know? We're gonna do a we're gonna do a financial show actually right after this, Alex. Uh, oh, start. nice! I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No. <laughs> Trevor's a stock guru here. He's got an algorithm. Um, so I kind of want to pick your brain a little bit because I knew know you said you had a master's and um, you know some stuff here regarding with Ringer recovery. And you you look you look like a young guy. You're in your late thirties, mid thirties. Twenty five. Oh, twenty five. Okay. <laughs> okay. So. That's my age. I was best with you. You're Trevor's age. So as I've noticed, though, once I hit like the mid thirties, man, my body just starts shutting down, man. It's just like an old car. You know, your body just starts breaking down. So what are, what are some tips you can give guys? We get guys every day, every day on the forum who, um, they're like, I want to take steroids. I, I'm, I'm injured. I want to take steroids. They think steroids are, helps them, uh, fix injuries. And we always tell them that steroids don't help you fix injuries. They actually make your injuries worse. So what are some actual practical advice that, you know, you've learned through dealing with your clients to actually help us prevent injuries and also heal injuries? Okay. So that's, I really like that question because a lot of my clientele are, we'll say from, we'll say 21 up to 45, 50. So obviously a lot of males. Um, whenever you're looking at a lot of injury prevention, let's take a step back and look at the basics of it. One of the reasons why a lot of people get injured is, is, very simple reasons, meaning a lot of people don't do, go through and want to waste 10 to 15 minutes per day just warming up, doing basic mobility work, doing something. I don't know if you can see behind me. I have um, the inversion table, something as small as using an inversion table every day in terms of helping with spinal health. OK, something like doing foam rolling. People don't want to take that 10 to 15 minutes away out of their day to keep up. And that's one of the differences between some of the highest level athletes I work with and the lowest level athletes. The lower ones aren't willing to take that 10 to 15 minutes to work on mobility, to care about their stretching, to take care of their joints, to take care of their soft tissue. So mobility, stretching, all that kind of fun stuff plays a really big role. You know, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Like a lot of my power lifters will get hurt whenever they get out of placement. So say they're so used to hitting depth on a squat, right? The parallel, that's as, as deep as they can go. And then they put a weight on their back that, you know, they're maybe not sure about. It's a little higher than their previous one rep max, puts them out of place and they get deeper then actual to parallel and they go below parallel. They get out of place, you know, muscles that are inactivated and underactivated, then try and take over. But guess what? They can't keep up because they're weak. They tear something, they pull something and they're injured. You're not gonna be able to make progress if you're injured. So one of the biggest things is making sure that you are mobile within your active range of motion. That's something that I feel like a lot of people kind of screw up, meaning it's awesome to be flexible, but you can almost be too flexible. Okay, so it's taking the time out the stretch. It's it's staying and working within your active range of motion. It is. I don't want to say I don't want to say not being an idiot, but just being an intelligent individual. Just being just being a smart you know adult with it. You know, not throwing around the weights in the gym. So that that's the basic things in terms of what you can do for recovery. Okay, then you look at injury prevention from a dietary standpoint. A lot of people, the trend today, and we always go through these trends and phases of nutrition. Right now, I've seen a lot of really high carbohydrate diets with, with no dietary fats. And 
a lot of people don't look at basic collagen synthesis and the role that dietary fats play in that. They don't look at all of the beneficial, you know, we'll say attributes of these essential fatty acids. So whenever people aren't getting in those dietary fats, it's doing a lot more harm to them than good. Can you give us some examples of what they should be eating more of and eating less of? So for, from, from a dietary fat side of things, we're looking at the essential fatty acids, um, you know, your fish oils, your krill oils from a supplemental aspect. If you're looking at from uh, more of a, um, you know, like an oil aspect, we're looking more at like your macadamia oils, your coconut, why not? maybe not coconut oil so much because everyone's really big on that because MCTs are, you know, they give you energy right away. And it's not going to store his body fat. And that's really blown out of proportion, you know, but your macnut oil is your extra virgin olive oils. And there's a lot of shitty ones out on the market, guys. So if you're looking at these, make sure you're getting high quality products. It's, if you don't find the right extra virgin olive oil right now, which is probably 90% out there are, are pretty much crap. Um, so you need to make sure you're getting the high quality essential fatty acids. Not only that, but you look at the beneficial essential fatty acids in different nuts and things like that. And so it's making sure you're not having an exclusion diet wherever you have one extremely high high amount of one macronutrient and you're completely excluding another. One simple thing that I'll do with my clients, because you know, not everyone responds well to a high fat diet, not everyone responds well to a high carbohydrate diet. So if you implement something like basic nutrient timing principles, where you can basically have higher fat intake, lower carbohydrate intake on your rest days, and then a higher carbohydrate intake, lower fat intake on your training days, then you're still getting in the essential fatty acids you need to grow, but you're gonna be able to have a little more favorable body composition. And body composition is another thing that's going to lead to your injuries. A lot of people are carrying a lot, a lot more body fat than they have. Although that's going to be great in terms of cushioning, having that adequate tissue around your joints, what happens when you get into prep and you get into those extremely low levels of body fat? A lot of people, it's almost like a shock to their system. It's like they go out, you know, it's summertime, it's really hot. They jump into cold water and it shocks you, you know, because they're used to carrying around 20% body fat. Now they are, you know, we'll say six weeks out from a the show, they're down to eight or 9% body fat. And they're not used to at least their joints moving without having that cushion. They get out of place, their mechanics change, and that's going to lead to injury. And I could, <laughs> I could pretty much go on and on about that shit. What about uh, how important is sleep and sleep quality? Me, how many me, hours a night should we be sleeping? Let me just add two things before you go on to that, Alex. So I love what you said about the need for some fatty acids. Your phospholipid bilayer is a structural component of all your cells. It's called phospholipid because it's fat. So you need some fat. So even if you're following a very high carb diet, you do need some essential fatty acids for membrane integrity of all your cells and also for brain function another big mistake i see people make is that they're just getting into weightlifting they'll go on youtube or something like that and they'll watch a video of me squat and they'll see me squat rock bottom you know my butt is almost touching yeah. my so deep. i have a really really good range of motion because i work on my mobility i work on my flexibility daily that person walked me into the gym for the first time chances are they're not going to have the mobility and range of motion that I do. So they're going to try to squat as deep as I can, and they're going to hurt themselves. So I always say, you know, yeah, you should squat below parallel if you have the range of motion to do so. If you don't, work on your mobility first, and then start doing that extremely deep range of motion. So I love what you said. Talk to us about sleep hours. Perfect. So love what you just added to that. I could Again, those are two more things that we can go even more on, but I won't. We'll go to sleep. Um, so sleep, if, if you look at a lot of the different, uh, we'll say injury type meta-analysis that are done out there, I, I believe it was something like they basically had people that would sleep, they'd get two hours of sleep versus four hours of sleep versus six hours versus eight hours. And the injury rate almost doubled from the four hours of sleep to the eight hours. So the people that got eight hours of sleep were at a 50% less risk of actually getting injury. Whereas the people who got four to six hours of sleep, they were a 50% greater risk of getting injury. So whenever you look at sleep, proper sleep patterns, it's, it's something that goes so unnoticed in our industry. And it's so funny we're talking about sleep now because I actually just went to the local sleep center. Um, I have an at-home sleep apnea test that I'm actually going to be taking tonight. And uh, that's one thing that as soon as you get to be generally with bodybuilders, especially with powerlifters, once you get to be of a, you know, a significant size, you start to experience sleep apnea. Could be for a multitude of reasons, but if you don't get that 
checked. If you don't get that covered, you're going to obviously not oxidize fatty acids as well. You're not going to increase any kind of hypertrophy as well because your sleep, your circadian rhythms, everything's thrown off. Sleep is so important. And not only sleep, but like you said, the quality of sleep. And that's the thing that a lot of people don't pay attention to. A lot of people go to bed 9 a.m. They wake up 6 you know, a.m. And they're never getting through every sleep cycle. They are drifting. They're, they're almost like, they just they, they always say, that, you know, I didn't have a good night's sleep. I was, like, I was up the whole time. And their better half says, you were snoring since not from, from nine to six. That's actually what my fiance said. That's why I got the sleep study test done because I felt like I was just sitting there and I'd hear her say, shut the fuck up. You're snoring so loud. And I'm like, I'm awake. Like I can't be snoring. And, and that's how bad sleep apnea can get. And if you have that, again, you're not going to recover well. You're going to increase your, your chance and risk of injury. You're not going to grow as well. You just go down the list. I've, I've had people who had sleep apnea and they were getting deeper into prep and it got to the point where they couldn't tolerate it. So we actually got them a CPAP, went through the medical, all that kind of fun stuff. They got it. And literally within a week or two, their physiques completely changed. I'm talking about people losing anywhere from five to 10 pounds on the scale just from adding in an actual CPAP machine because your quality of sleep improves. And remember, whenever you're sleeping, your body's repairing itself. It's getting everything done that it can't really do during the day because it's focusing on every other biological process. So sleep, quality of sleep is extremely important, especially like you said, for actually preventing injury. And uh, this, this sleep apnea test that you're doing, what does it cost on that? And where did you go exactly to get that done? Um, because I, I definitely want to look into that as well. I've never gotten one of those done. Trevor, have you gotten one of those done? I sleep fantastic. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it stays that way. Yeah. Yeah, it really does get to be a bitch. It was during my last prep and I was down to about 210 pounds, striated quads, striated glutes, and I was still having really bad sleep apnea. So for me, obviously in the off season, you get a little fluffy, you get some fat under your neck. That's not going to help the problem. But once you reach certain level size, it's just going to happen. It's part of the process. So what I did was obviously I didn't want to pay out of the pocket for a CPAP. You can buy a CPAP online for like, you know, one to five grand, but I would rather just have my insurance pay for the most of it. Um, not only that, but they also have to actually, uh, you know, program it a certain way to actually work with your specific rhythm and with your specific issue. And I don't know enough on the subject to program it myself. So I wanted to go to a professional. So go to your local doctor. You basically tell them, you know, your local family doctor, you say, Hey, I have sleep apnea. He recommends you to go to a sleep center. You go over the sleep center they basically diagnose you in-house luckily the the girl that i went with um she's actually an athlete herself she's she's like in her 50s or something and she she still does a lot of strength and conditioning work so she understands it she gets it you know a lot of doctors at least in the states they don't always quite understand so i got really lucky with that she understood she sent me home with a sleep test and the way it works um is basically it has three different sensors so one sensor that goes around your chest so it'll actually test the actual expansion of your rib cage and how your breathing is. It has uh, an actual, um, it basically looks like whenever you have an oxygen machine, so it goes in your nose, so it checks your breathing rate. And then there's also one that goes on, it's supposed to be your, uh, the, um, not your main hand, your opposite hand on either your pointer finger or your middle finger. And that is basically to, I believe that one is to test different rates of expiration, but I'm not hundred percent sure on that one. And all three of these together are taken. You put it on before bed, turn on a little light, they all blink green and everything. Wake up in the morning, turn it off, take it in, and they basically interpret it. So if you can get that to a doctor, obviously your insurance is going to pay the majority of it. CPAP machines, I believe I'll still probably have to pay a couple hundred bucks for it, but it's not compared to a couple grand. Alex, one question I have for you is you mentioned contest prep. Um, a lot of the listeners of our podcast are steroid users. Um, steroid particularly very androgenic steroids like trenbolone are horrible for causing insomnia. Do you have any suggestions for someone who's using, let's say, trend um, and is going through insomnia, anything that might help them? Yeah, so um, the, the best aid that I found, and it, you have to make sure that you're obviously, you know, further out from the show to utilize this, but it's MK677. You guys know that growth hormone secretagog. It is probably the best thing at increasing REM sleep, getting people into their sleep cycles. I've had people use that up to about two weeks out, keeps them very full, increases nitrogen retention, increases recovery. And it's probably one of the only things out there that's going to be able to combat at least the insomnia effects from trend. It's a shame because I don't like adding another drug to combat another drug. 
but at the same time you add in your melatonins, your 5-HTPs, your GABAs, all that kind of fun stuff. And it just, it's, it's not enough to help a lot of people. But again, you have some people that are hyper metabolizers of trend. You have some people that are hypo metabolizers of trend. So depending on how you metabolize the compound, I've had some guys that get zero side effects on four to 500 milligrams of trend, which is a very good dosage. And other people, they put in 150 and they can't sleep. They're already sweating like crazy. So depending on the person, it's kind of how you have to diagnose it. But no matter what, as long as you're a couple weeks out from the show and you can get away with using MK and not actually have too much of the lethargy, too much of the actual appetite increasings, um, you can you can really help your sleep a lot better that way. Because so many people towards the end of contest prep, obviously sleep gets diminished, insomnia is extremely high, and then recovery starts going downhill. Their physique starts getting that tired look. Um, Trevor, when you were on my podcast, we talked about adrenals. That's whenever adrenals start getting taxed even crazier because not only do you have the stimulants throughout the day, you have the insomnia, insomnia from trend, you have this lack of sleep that's leading to less recovery. It just cascades into the perfect storm for people not showing up at their best on stage. And that's one thing that I don't feel like a lot of people understand, meaning a lot of people will watch the Olympia. That's the only thing they'll watch and they'll say, oh, he came in off. It's so easy to peak. How come he didn't peak? This is his job. It's not that fucking hard or it's not that fucking easy to peak perfectly every time. You know, especially when you have all these different factors in play. I agree with you completely. So, Alex, I got another question for you. This one's from Nolan. Question for both you and Alex. How did you both start your journey as prep coaches? And what advice would you give to someone such as myself who's trying to build up their coaching business? So, I'll, I'll just speak briefly, and then, Alex, you can answer this question in depth. The number one advice I can give to someone starting an online personal training business is be genuine. You know, treat every client like it's your last. Um, I get hundreds of emails per day. 99% of those emails aren't from paying clients, but I still answer them for free. And I remember those names. If you, if someone answers, sends you an email with a question, you take the time of your day to help them. Chances are a couple of months down the road, once they've got some additional income, they're going to hire you for a program. So that's the best advice I can give you. And also your current clients are your best uh, salespeople. You will get most of your clients from referrals if you do a good job. So treat every client like it's your last. Um, be as helpful as you can and be genuine. That, 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 that's literally perfect advice, man. I couldn't agree with that more. It's it's funny because I, I never, I've always had like more of an extremist mentality. So it's either been 100% or nothing. And I never understood how anyone could do a job day in, day out, year after year, and it's setting them up for the rest of their life for 20, 30 plus years if they hate it. So if you are really trying to get into prep coaching, I already said my story about how I got started. It was really by accident, but I was always following my passion. It wasn't bought going at first it was boxing it was lacrosse it was but I, I always worked out working out eating properly looking at nutrition that was always interesting to me so if you're really passionate about being a coach you only really need two things you need passion and a good work ethic if you have those two things you're going to be successful plain and simple I don't feel like, you know, obviously everyone says chase your dreams and certain pay people will say you need to, uh, you know, obviously be honed in with, with reality and you can't dream too big and all that kind of bullshit. I say, fuck that. You should shoot for the stars. If you really want something, if you really love something, you can do it. You just might have to work a little bit harder than someone else. But if you're passionate about it, that's OK, because you enjoy that hard work. So that's probably the best advice that I could give you. And like Trevor said, put out information, put out good content. Like you're doing this podcast. I have my podcast. It's the more you can give out for the people that can't afford you as a prep coach or can't afford other people as a prep coach, the more they're going to appreciate you. It's, it's plain and simple. People are going to buy from people they trust. So if you can be open and honest, and, and that's why I've always, like I had a, a YouTube channel before it got taken down and it was over a thousand videos from like years and years ago. And it was just, you know, a way that I could talk to people and get them to know who I was as a prep coach before they actually hired me because I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay money that I busted my ass for to someone that I didn't know. So that YouTube channel was always there to get people to just know me better. And you know, you have to be yourself. If you are someone who's loud and very energetic, like Mark Lobliner, be that person. If you're someone who's a little more reserved, be that person. It, it doesn't matter because you're going to attract the right people depending on who you are anyway, you know? One thing I'll say, and I'll let Steve build on this, is that you also have to have the right personality to be a prep coach. You have to be a people person. 
like my phone is constantly going off. I wake up to 30 to 40 text messages. I wake up to 40 to 50 emails. If you're not a people person, if you don't like replying to emails day after day, nonstop, don't be a prep coach. You could do something <laughs> with me. Steve is a great example. Steve is a very smart guy. He's passionate about the industry, but he doesn't really like dealing with people individually. So he writes articles, <laughs> he writes eBooks, he does his podcast with me. You know, that's perfect for Steve because that fits his personality. Where me, on the other hand, I get kind of bored writing an ebook. I'd much rather be interacting with people, socializing with people. So you need to really ask yourself, do I have the personality to be a prep coach? And there, there's an even further difference between being a prep coach that works with your everyday individuals and being a prep coach that works with actual competitors. A example, this past weekend, I had two guys competing in the UK, so there's a five hour time difference. I had timers set about, I think it was every half hour, every hour from 11 p.m. on Friday night until, let's see, I think it was like 5 p.m. on Sunday. So every half hour, that timer was going off because I had to contact someone. I had to get in touch with someone and see what they were doing. I had to get pictures, we had to adjust. And that's the biggest difference between if you're working with competitors or if you're working with you know your average everyday person, it, it's really what you want. But again, don't take on that responsibility if you if it's not something you're really passionate about because you'll have to do that. So Alex, I wanna I wanna ask you one more question, then I'll let Steve jump in if he has any questions. So we're recording this podcast at 8 p.m. Let our listeners know what today looked like for you. So kind of tell us like what time you woke up, what you did when you woke up, you know when you ate, when you went to the gym, everything like that. Kind of give us the day in the life of you know someone who is doing this full time. <clears throat> okay, so let's see today. It's funny because I if you've ever seen the Groundhog Day with Bill Murray, that's pretty much my life. It's it's the same thing every day, but there's maybe one or two little differences. So essentially I wake up every day. First thing I do before I even get out of bed, before I even check my phone, because like you said, Trevor. You know, whenever you check your phone, you're going to have Instagram messages, you're going to have texts, you're going to have emails, you're going to have all these things and distractions. I like setting up my day in a very positive manner. So I wake up, take a deep breath. I do a little deep belly breathing, a little just very light meditation and, and just think about my priorities for the day. I, I think about setting up my day to be very positive, you know, so my priorities in my life are it's very five things. Very simple. It's my fiance. It's my little Shih Tzu Molly. It's being a better person. It's my company and quality building. So those five things I probably talk about and think about at least a couple dozen times per day. So I wake up, I think that I get my deep belly breathing in and I wake up out of bed extremely fresh and extremely ready and excited to start my day. Take a big, nice shit to start off my day, go in, have breakfast with my fiance, respond to emails. And then throughout the day, it's pretty much all of that. It's eating every two to three hours. It's responding to emails. It is creating new client protocols. It is, you know, adjusting peak weeks. It is uh, putting out content, whether it's podcasts or Instagram posts or all that kind of fun stuff. Um, today, I did go to the sleep center to obviously pick up my sleep apnea test that I'll be doing tonight. But other than that, that that's pretty much my day. You know, uh, today, for example, was a rest day for myself. So sadly, didn't get to work out. But I am fucking pumped up for tomorrow. It's a heavy squat session. So really already getting excited for that. Um, but that, that's really my day. It's, it's literally email after email, program after program, constantly doing the same thing. I don't do a lot of different things. I just do a lot of the same things, but it's fun to me because every different person has a different problem. It's, it's like a different problem. You have to solve a different equation. So one example was today I had probably eight, we'll say eight or nine different people that sent me blood work. So a lot of the day was spent interpreting blood work, looking at different you know protocols we can implement to correct whether it was poor cholesterol levels, uh, poor liver enzymes. Um, one guy who, I won't get too much into it, but he's pushing pretty fucking hard in prep right now and his blood work is immaculate. Like I wish I had his blood work right now just at, on a cruise. And it, you know, you get those kind of emails, you get really excited because like, how the, how the hell is your physiology doing this right now with what you're taking? So little things like that just interest me. And that's my day, man. It's, it's very simple, probably boring to some, but I freaking love it. Steve, I'm, I'm curious, what is, what does your day look like? Oh, my day? Yeah. Man, I just sleep in until like 2 p.m., bro. Just cry <laughs> myself all night. I was kidding. It just depends, man. Like uh, tomorrow morning, wake it up, going fishing for half the day, come home and nice. do all the shit you guys are talking about. Check my, my all my emails. I don't like uh, coaching at all. 
Um, <laughs> I get people hitting me up all the time wanting me to set up programs for them. And I'm like, ah, I nope. just sent them to you, Trevor. <laughs> I don't have time for that shit. So, uh, but yeah, I work full time. And uh, so I'm always writing and I'm always, you know, getting people asking me to do articles and stuff. So that's pretty nice. much. But like what you said, Alex, um, you know, that's very impressive for someone your age to be thinking like that because I used to be the same way in my twenties and um, I came across a book in a movie called The Secret. I don't know if you've seen it, no. but, but that movie, if you watch it, you'll be like, holy shit, I, I'm doing this already. Cause they tell you in that movie, the first thing you do when you wake up is look at positive things, go through the positive things. Like you said, your fiance, your dog, you know, your career's doing well, all that stuff. Cause if you don't, everything's going to go to shit. So you got to think positive as soon as you get up. Don't hit the negativity. Before you go to bed, same thing. Think of the positives in your life. And that's how you become a successful person. And I was the same way in my 20s. I was very successful at a young age as well. And then, um, you know, I follow that now. I'm actually, like, I like to do yoga before bed and just unwind and forget everything and just stretch. So that's really, you know, helped me, um, you know, go through this stuff as well. So that's really good. Um, that you, you're doing that um, at your age. So I'm very impressed by that. That's, that's how you can tell someone's successful, um, you know, right off the bat. So I want to kind of pick your brain on, on this question as well. I like to ask our guests this. Um, I'm assuming, you know, you do a lot of um, things in the gym with people and, you know, in, in, you know, in person, all this stuff. You're in the gym a lot. What are some of the mistakes you guys know, you notice with people training in the gym that you look at and you like shake your head and you're like, so many people make this mistake. I'll give you an example. Like if I go to a franchise gym, I see like uh, half the guys in there wearing wraps and straps and gloves and belts and all this stuff. And they're little, little skinny guys. They're not even doing heavy weights or nothing. And I just think to myself, you know, why do you need all those accessories? Just go in there and live raw, you know, and, and put in, and they're doing, you know, the little uh, 20 pound curls in front of the mirror. I'm like, dude, go do some fucking pull-ups, go do some deadlifts, do some compound lifts. Those are the mistakes <laughs> that I see in these franchise gyms. So what are some things, you know, small, big that you see um, that people need to work on that our listeners can, uh, can learn from here? So it's, it's nice that your listeners sound like they're more of the, we'll say the experienced people, the people that are going to be competitors, people that are trying to change their physique, because I'm all about fitness, whether you are trying to compete, just trying to be healthy, as long as you're in the gym moving, and that's awesome, that, that is awesome, because so much of America is obese and just horrible with their, with their health markers, because no one moves anymore. But with your, with your crowd, that's different. So the people that aren't just your average everyday people, the people that are making, um, you know, they're trying to be competitors or trying to make a substantial change to their physique. What do I see wrong? No one fucking trains hard and it pisses me off. I see people going in there exactly like you said, doing the same thing they do. First of all, they have like, there's apparently a trend now where everyone wears, wears really skinny jeans or really skinny pants that, you know, these, these tight little uh, tank tops and shit. And they go in the corner and like you said, they curl five pound dumbbells and then they'll go or they'll go and they'll do the same bench movement every day after day, never putting any weight on the bar. I feel like effort, not just intensity, but effort is just gone today. And I feel like a lot of that has to do with Trevor's and my generation where, you know, we, I, don't, I don't feel like our generation necessarily has the best work ethic. And I hate to classify everyone into that category because you have people that aren't, but the vast majority of people will not fucking work hard. In you know the problem, Alex, off the scene. Everything's that? freezing. Everything's yeah. freezing. That's that's what like I can sit right now. I don't have to I don't have to cook food. I can go on, you know, skip the dishes. It's delivered to me. You, you know what I mean? Like most mm-hmm. most people have their parents paying for their entire university education. Like everything is way too easy. Everyone has this sense of yeah. entitlement. Like I wake up deserving all this stuff. Exactly. I, you said it perfectly. And that shit pisses me off because ever since I was young, my parents always raised me to have a good work ethic, to work for whatever I wanted. They always said, Hey, you can do whatever you want, chase whatever your dreams are, but you got to fucking work for it. So I always, I always did something around the house for an allowance. And then as soon as you can get a job legally, I had a job. And then, you know, you go to college, well, guess what? You know what? Student loans are going to suck for you and I'm still paying them back. But that, that's part of it. You need that responsibility. You need that work ethic. And like you said, everything's so accessible. Everything's so easy for people in our generation. 
why wouldn't that apply for fitness? And that's a sad thing it does. And now you have all of this information out there from the PED side of things, all these different compounds where people think that they can drug up their physique to, to get to where they want to be even faster than if they would take either the natural route or the actual hard work route. And it, it's a shame because not only can you tell who those people are, but they don't get the physique that you think they get. You know, you see people in the gym running. I've seen people in the gym who I know personally that run three to four grams a year and they are maybe 180 pounds skinny fat. Like they do not have an impressive physique at all. You want to know why? because that physique was built on drugs. What do all of these drugs do? They just accelerate the process. You know, you, you have people referencing these studies that show that, you know, one shot of testosterone builds more muscle than any natural person. And it's the person wasn't even working out who, who used testosterone. That does, I hate when people fucking use that example because you see all these gym rats running all this gear, they don't look like shit because they're still squatting. They're doing shallow squats with one plate. They are benching it and just doing all this rep work or no one's, no one's putting in any effort. You know what I mean? It's just, it's really a shame to see. I hate it. Alex, well, Alex, let, me talk, let me talk about the studies because this is the big problem with abstract warriors. People who find this study on PubMed <laughs> abstract and don't read the full study. So those studies are basically in older adults and it's people suffering from low testosterone. So yep. it'll be a man who is suffering from low testosterone. They give that man, you know, a testosterone therapy dosage of, you know, maybe 100, 150 milligrams of testosterone per week. And then they see, oh, wow, this guy is, you know, increasing muscle mass, losing body fat. That's because they're fixing a hormone imbalance. Giving someone with low testosterone a small dosage of testosterone so that they now have healthy hormone levels is completely different in giving someone with healthy hormones a small dosage of testosterone. There, you, you cannot compare the two, it's apples to oranges. So whenever someone references these studies, I'm like, <laughs> did you read it? <laughs> <laughs> apply to you. You're not a 70 year old man, 70 year old uh -huh. man with low testosterone. You're a healthy 25 year old guy with perfect hormone levels. Yep. You don't believe me. And, and sure enough, they go and do their own thing. They run the cycle and then uh, four months later, they email me back saying, hey, you were right. But that's what people don't understand. And that's what drives me nuts about all of this. We're, we're a society that's rich in information, but void of, void of knowledge. And the problem is people, they just read the abstract. They don't actually read the entire study. Yeah, and that, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, I don't know if we talked about it before. I, I, I probably talk about it with a couple dozen people every day, where in today's society, we have people who are either all research-based or all experience-based. And no one can use common sense and just meet in the middle. I don't care what any study says. I don't care what someone with 30 years of experience says. If something doesn't work for your own biological makeup, it's not going to work for you. Everyone's different. The same thing goes into dosages. I made, I made a video on this a while back about how I get so pissed off how in today's society, if someone runs a specific amount of gear, they'll get you know shit on online because it's way too much for them. You know, they shouldn't be using that much at that level of experience. Or someone says, you know, they don't use that much and then they still get shit on because they say, oh, there's no way you're not running that much. And people don't understand the biolog biological injury individuality of everyone, how different we all are, how our metabolic rates are. If there's no one size fits all diet for everyone, like, like Trevor, your, your caloric intake compared to my caloric intake, your training compared to my training. Bet you it's vastly different because we are biologically different. So why wouldn't the same apply for drugs? Some people can take ibuprofen and their liver enzymes, their, their kidneys, they're going to be fine. Other people take ibuprofen and it crushes their organs. It's the exact same thing. Everything is so different based on the person and people can't use that common sense and just say, hey, this is what the research says. This is what the experience says. Let's try it out and see which one actually works. Steve, did you have something to add? So, you know, I, I totally agree um, with the intensity. I notice this a lot when I go to the gym. I went to the gym today. I was in there in and out 35, 40 minutes. And that includes ending my work. That includes warming up, includes stretching at the end. And I still see people in there. And whenever I'm leaving the gym, I see people just sitting on the machine, oh. just sitting there. <laughs> and it's like I'm walking across to, like, watch, you know, wash my hand or wash whatever I was using or something. I walk the other way and they're still just sitting there. It's just like, yep. like a rock. And it's just like, dude, uh, lift, you know, you're just sitting on your fucking ass and there's no intensity for sure. So 
guys listening, listen, if you're not getting the results you want, you guys need to just step up your intensity and just, you know, really get things going in the gym and leave your phone in your car. I mean, unless it's like an emergency or something where you can take your phone, leave your phone in the car because you're going to play with it. You're going to check your messages and all this stuff. So on that note too, with diet, everyone who's a guy, I've never had a guy tell me they don't want to build more muscle and lose fat. So on the diet front, what are guys doing wrong that are either overweight, you know, and they can't lose weight. They always complain, oh, I can't lose weight, I can't lose weight. And the opposite, guys who can't gain muscle, who are just skinny, and they complain, oh, I can't gain muscle. So yeah, I want to hop on steroids because I want to build muscle. So let me just hop on steroids without fixing my diet. What are the mistakes both sides are doing that are glaring that you see? So from, from a dietary aspect, I, I feel like it comes down to people not recognizing the bigger picture. So going back to people being on polar opposites, in, in our industry, it's you're either you're on a meal plan or you count your macros. You know, it seems like those are the, like the two camps, right? Everyone's like, if it fits your macros or clean eating for, again, and that those terms are so bastardized, we won't get into that. But I feel like people just miss the bigger picture of, okay, you, you have your overall caloric intake, basic thermodynamics, how much energy you expend, how much energy you intake. Okay, then you break it down into your macronutrients. You know, you look at high protein diets. Look at all the literature from Dr. Jose Antonio. Look at all of the success over the years, like Dante Trudell had with all his clients having a high protein intake. Look at all of the different attributes that each macronutrient can contribute. Like we talked about the, the health benefits of fat earlier. You know, then after you break down your calories and your macronutrients, then look at nutrient timing. Like I talked about earlier a little bit, the, the nutrient timing basics, you know, where you're basically trying to think about it as, as like an hour to hour basis of what your body needs. This is one thing that whenever I worked with Milos, he really taught me well. And that was that, you know, you should really be utilizing the substrate that you're going to be needing for the next couple of hours. So it's, it's basically like, it's like a three hour diet. So we would have periods of the day where we were focusing on anabolism and other periods of the day where we would focus on lipolysis. So if people can think about it from that aspect, like me right now, I'm sitting down at a desk, you know, we're doing this podcast. What did I, what did I eat before this podcast? I had ground beef and I had macadamia nut oil because I don't necessarily need any glucose. I'm not expending a ton amount of energy. And so if you look at it like that, like I think it was Eric Helms who made that pyramid. Um, I believe it was him on, on, on nutrition and it goes, you know, calories, macronutrients, nutrient timing, nutrient density. And then there was like supplements and all that kind of stuff. But if you think about it from that perspective, that's what I see people are missing because they will stick to either, you know, they're, they're like, Oh, keto is the only way to lose fat or, you know, you, you, you have to have extremely high carbs all the time. And if you, you drop your carbs below 200 grams per day, then you're going to just lose your muscle. And so people are buying into the fallacies and all these different, I don't want to say myths, but all these different fad diets that are out there instead of taking a step back and saying, okay, is this, you know, diet going to be hypo or hypercaloric? And then going from there, you know? So I really feel like people just miss the basics. It's the same thing with training. Like we talked about people miss the basic compound movements because it's fucking hard. You know, and how many people when actually track their intake every day, have a specific breakdown of macronutrients, of calories, and eat the same thing every day? A lot of people don't. When it really comes down to it, Alex, you can summarize everything you just said into people not being cognizant of what they're doing. Yep. Um, so often people go to the gym, they have no idea what body part they're going to be training, they have no idea what exercises they're going to be doing, they just walk into the gym, they see someone doing curls, like, okay, I'll do a couple sets of curls. Then they see maybe the pec decks open, like, okay, I'll do a couple of sets of pec deck. Then, you know, they're like, oh, maybe I'll go on the stepper for 20 minutes. Then they might do some abs and they leave, right? And then same with diet. Like, I get so many DMs on Instagram, emails. Someone's like, hey, man, I can't build muscle. And I'm always super friendly and super helpful. I say, well, uh, give me an example of what you ate yesterday. You know, uh, I'd be more than happy to give me my give me my two cents like oh i don't remember you know they have no idea what they're eating they have no idea what what they're working out like and what it really comes down to it is you need to get a plan you know if, if you want you know something like a blueprint to follow you can go on my website i've got my daily diet and workout programs listed you can use that as like a template and kind of like individualize it to your goals but it's really just not being cognizant of what they're doing and it's kind of like going to school and just walking into a random classroom every day. Are you going <laughs> to learn anything? No. Like, I like that. 
one day you might learn a little bit about chemistry. The next day you might learn a little bit about biology. The next one you might walk into some political science class. Um, yeah. You know, maybe you luck out and in one classroom they, they're giving out free pizza that day, but I mean, <laughs> you're not going to really get anywhere. My, my favorite, my favorite example is whenever someone reaches out and they say, again, like you said, I can't build muscle. And like you said, always super nice, but I love when the reply is, you know, what they ate the other day and it was uh, pizza and an apple. <laughs> like, okay, there's your answer. <laughs> or whatever my mom cooked for supper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's uh, people under eat protein. I mean, this subject can be beat to death. Everyone, I feel like the ma- vast majority of our population, not even athletes, under consume protein so drastically, especially females. Under consuming protein and using way too many freaking protein shakes. I know, yes. Steve, I'll let you build on this, but so many times I'll be like, hey, you can't build muscle. Sure, send me your diet. Protein shake, protein shake, protein bar, protein shake, protein shake. Pro- I'm like, do you not have access to the <laughs> So, Steve, I'll let you uh, ask Alex any more questions. We've got about five minutes left, Alex. So, if you got any closing topics you want. I'm, I'm doing, Alex, I don't know if you read uh, the articles that I write, but uh, I'm doing a series on uh, basically like old school physiques. And uh, today I wrote one. Um, you know, I've been kind of doing, you know, these guys from the 80s. You know, all the big top 10 Mr. Olympias from the 80s. And I noticed when their nutrition layouts were f- put forth, there is a void of fruit. Like, they'll eat peanut butter. That was a very popular thing they would, they would eat in the, in the 80s. Um, and today, it's like, we don't eat so much peanut butter. It seems like, I know Trevor's not a fan of peanut butter, but I noticed fruit is, is the void back then. What are your opinions based on what you've found out? I mean, you're only in your mid twenties, but what, what have you found out about fruit when it comes to nutrition and fitness and bodybuilding? Because maybe it's not the same thing, you know, for everybody, but what's, what's your stance on fruit? Do you consume fruit? Yeah. So for everyone out there listening, go back and listen to the episode that I did with Trevor and Trevor, I believe you talked about fruit somewhere else as well. We covered it for a good, like, 10 to 20 minutes or whatever that was. But to me, it always goes back to moderation. When you look at fruit, why did people demonize it? Well, because a lot of people demonize carbs because they demonize sugar, because they think that a simple insulin spike is going to automatically store body fat magically. Like thermodynamics doesn't mean shit. Okay. So that, that's why I feel like a lot of people avoid fruit when in reality, look at what it's offering you. Okay. You are getting a lot of micronutrients, a lot of phytonutrients, all these vitamins, all these minerals, if you're not healthy, if you're not operating well internally, then why does your body have any reason to do anything well externally? You see some people that, you know, they, they can drug, drug themselves up to a good physique, but internally it's shit and that's going to show on their physique down the line. So fruit is inherently good. It's inherently healthy. That's the, I mean, you're brought up, you get, you're taught to eat your fruits and your vegetables for a reason. Now it goes back to moderation. I actually, just started adding in more fruit into my diet. Um, you know, my uh, fiance actually makes a nice fruit salad, which I absolutely love. We get to a local little um, organic fruit market. But either way, um, it's, it's all about moderation. We talked about how fruit is actually metabolized. We talked about fructose, high fructose, and all that kind of stuff in our episode that me and Trevor did. But I don't feel like it's inherently bad. I don't feel like anything's inherently bad. You know, to me, it always goes back to a moderation issue. Um, I don't see many people sitting down and eating, you know, 20 apples or sitting down and eating, you know what I mean? Like pounds and pounds of blueberries and bananas and all that kind of stuff, because obviously you're going to be hurt with that. But I mean, what if you sit down and take 20 ibuprofen or what if you do, you know, I don't want to use this example, but 20 lines of Coke instead of one, like, (laughs) you know, what's going to happen with that. So to me, it just goes back to moderation. You know, it's, it's using common sense and eating like an adult, not eating like an idiot, because the whole um, the whole wave of the people that misunderstood if it fits your macros was basically didn't matter as long as I hit my macros, I get filled with all the bullshit. When in reality, it meant just count your freaking macronutrient intake and fill it with high quality sources. And if you have a little bit of leeway here and there, that's fine. Great. Uh, I can say it better myself, Alex. There's a famous saying, everything is poison. It's the dosage that determines whether or not it's lethal. So too much of anything will kill you. You drink too much water in one sitting, you'll die because it'll dilute your electrolytes. So literally anything can kill you if you take too much of it. 
Exactly. And that's, again, just another issue with our society where the more is better mentality, you know, and, and that doesn't necessarily apply to fruit. I don't know people that apply that to fruit, but you know what I'm trying to say. 100%. So Alex, for listeners, if anyone's interested in contacting you to learn more about your prep services, would your website, theprepcoach.com, be the best way to get a hold of you? That's perfect. It's, it's a really shitty Rinky Dink website. If you look at it, it literally, I wanted to set it up so it looked like a resume. Like you said, Trevor, it looks like crap and I probably have to redo it. But I set it up so literally it's, it's like I'm applying for a job because I thought people, if they're going to come to me, they should really see what I'm about. So if you go on this, the prepcoach.com, scroll down to the bottom, there's basically links to my Instagram, to my uh, video channel, to all that kind of bullshit. And if you just Google Alex Kickle, I'll, I'll probably come up. I'm going to share my IT guy with you, Alex. We'll, uh, we'll get you. <laughs> right on. Be the prepcoach.com 2.0. There you go. Trevor Kuritsen for my co-host, Steve Smee. And for our special guest, Alex Kickle, this is another episode of Evolutionary Radio. Live your life. Look good, do you? Thanks for listening. Thank you.